Hey guys, and welcome to the Moms and Murder podcast, a true crime podcast featuring myself, Mandy, and my dear friend, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Mandy. How are you? I am doing awesome, and we have some wonderful news to share with our listeners this week. So you don't even care how I'm doing. This week, you just (laughs) breezed on by me and are getting to your special (laughs) news. You said you were doing great, right? Oh, did I? I actually don't even know if I waited. Oh, this has really just gone off the rails from the beginning. But yeah. what is our news, Mandy? Please. It doesn't matter how I'm doing. What is our news? Yeah. So we are going to be at CrimeCon this year in what? June. Yes, it's in June. I think 7th through 9th. Yep. Yes, in New Orleans. And um, we will be there on Podcast Row. I don't know how this happened, but it did. So if you guys are planning on going to CrimeCon, you can see us there. And if you have not bought your ticket for CrimeCon yet, you can get 10% off your standard badge if you use our code M and M. 19. So, yeah. M moms and, and Murder M. 19, Moms Mandy and Melissa 19. It's all Whatever. in the name. Yeah. You'll find it. You'll but remember. it's all spelled out, so not like a and sign. So M-A-N-D-M 19. So use that and get 10% off and come to CrimeCon. I hear it's amazing. Last year, we didn't go to CrimeCon, and we both had like the most ridiculous FOMO, seeing everybody's pictures, um, having such a great time, and and getting to interact with all these you know big figures in the true crime world. So, Oh, I straight up was not on social media the entire weekend because my like <laughs> jealousy was really getting the best of me. So I'm very excited to be going this year. We can't wait. I promise will awkwardly hug you. Mandy will like regularly hug you, but I can awkwardly (laughs) hug people. I'll probably pat you on the head and apologize maybe for being born. I don't know. It'll just be a whole thing. So that should be worth the price of admission, I think. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I will hand out real hugs and, you know, just to make up for Melissa's side hugs. They're real for me. They're real. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. So we are really excited about that and can't wait to meet some of our listeners, I know a lot of our listeners have talked about going in the past and said that they're hoping to go this year. So I'm really excited about it. I think Melissa's really excited about it. Super excited. Yeah. And we'll ha- we'll come up with something between now and then when we have more details. We'll let you guys know what what all we'll be doing when we're there. Besides watching Bravo. I totally plan to watch Bravo late into the night. So yeah. Mandy. <laughs> <laughs> So getting into our case this week, um, we have a story out of Hawaii, which is new for us. I don't think we've ever done a case from from that beautiful tropical paradise that is Hawaii. Um, So this case actually was suggested to us and written and researched by Mary Jane, who has done a couple episodes for us in the past. And she's done such a great job in the past that we decided to ask her if she wanted to officially be on our little team here that only consists of me and Melissa right now. So, <laughs> so It's a very small team. In any sporting event, we would lose every single time. But we're so glad to have her as a an official helper, a, yeah. an official person. I mean, don't tell the tax man all of this stuff. But yeah, she's official. <laughs> we're official. Yes, if you know how is. to do accounting, let me know. Absolutely. So she actually lives there in Hawaii. So she had a personal connection to this case, which we'll talk about towards the end. So before we jump into the case this week, we are going to do a very quick, we Googled this city out of Honolulu. I will keep this brief, Mandy. As of the 2010 census, Honolulu has a population of 953,000 people. But this census is not so cut and dry because according to the Hawaiian state constitution, any island that is not named as belonging to a certain county actually belongs to Honolulu. And because of this, it makes Honolulu around 1,500 miles long and thus making it the largest city in the world. For once, all of my census ban- banter, like, actually <laughs> took a turn. <laughs> Got a little more exciting. So there are more than 100 beaches that surround Honolulu, which is more than almost any other city in the world. And the word Honolulu can actually be translated to sheltered bay or place of shelter in Hawaiian. Mandy, doesn't this just sound like a place you would love? You're like such a beach person. Yes, actually, I would love Hawaii. (laughs) Right? So here's some bad news for you, Mandy. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) I'm taking this dream away from you right now. So did you know that it's actually against the law in Honolulu to board more than 15 cats or dogs in one place? (laughs) Why? (laughs) Because they don't want you to live there, Mandy. They're just just done with it. They just made this rule. 
Um, and adding insult to injury, it's also illegal to own a mongoose in Hawaii, which oh. I didn't know people were trying to own. And if that news makes you just want to annoy a bird, well, don't do that. That's also illegal. And that will really give you something to squawk about. Get me out of here. Just keep going. <laughs> and it never started. All right. So Oahu is the third largest of the Hawaiian islands. And the word Oahu means the gathering place. Oahu alone is home to one million people, two thirds of the total population of the Hawaiian island chain. It is home to the capital city of Honolulu, which Melissa just told us some very fun facts about, as well as historical sites like Pearl Harbor and world famous surf spots such as Waikiki Beach and the North Shore Pipeline. Oahu is an incredibly transient island with tourists coming and going and a large military population that move on and off the island every two to five years. In 1985, Hawaii was enjoying a resurgence of tourism activity after the U.S. was recently coming out of an almost three-year economic recession. Then, on May 29, 1985, Vicki Purdy, the wife of an Army helicopter pilot that was stationed in Hawaii, went to meet up with friends at a Waikiki hotspot to go dancing. At around midnight, a taxi driver dropped her off at the Shorebird Hotel to pick up her car, but Vicki never got into her car. When she didn't show up at home... Her husband, Gary Purdy, repeatedly paged her and got no response. He figured she was having a great time and would probably be home later than expected, so he went to bed and thought that he would just see her the next morning. Unfortunately, Vicky never came home. Gary was frantic the next morning and decided to drive into Waikiki to look for her. He found her car parked at the Shorebird Hotel, but there was no sign of her. He contacted the police to report her missing. The next morning, Vicky's body was found on an embankment in the Ke'ehi Lagoon. She had been sexually assaulted, her hands bound behind her back, and strangled. Gary suspected her death was related to her job at a video store where two women had been stabbed to death just a year earlier. The video store sold pornographic movies, and it was considered that, given the sexual nature of this crime, the killer could have been someone that frequented the store and saw Vicky there. Police later dismissed the connection because neither of the women killed in the video store were bound or sexually assaulted. Can we rewind just a little bit to the part where her husband thought that it could have been due to where she was working? You don't hear that a lot, like in stories like this, where somebody's, where they're like, what could have happened? And everybody's always like, I don't know. I don't know. I had no enemies. And then to have this thing where, unfortunately, something not similar, but two other women had been killed within a year that she knew that she worked with. Yeah. I don't know. That just has to be, it's just different, I think, in these stories to be like, oh yeah, there's there was another thing that we've yeah. had that's happened in our life. So that was really sad to me and, and great that he remembered that kind of thing so they could at least rule it out right away. Yeah. Well, you can definitely see how they would, how somebody could think there might be a connection there. Right. Mm-hmm. Because of just the close, you know, the close in time, you know, how close they were in time. So- Right. Yeah, at least, you know, they did have – that is different to have somebody actually saying, like, well, here's a lead for you right off the right, bat. So, right, right, right. Yeah. Six months later, on January 14th, 1986, 17-year-old Regina Sakamoto had missed her bus to school in Waipahu. The last person who had talked to her was her boyfriend, and she had actually called him around 7.15 a.m. that morning to tell him that she had missed her bus and she was probably going to be late. She never did arrive at school. She was considered a missing person for an entire month, and then in February, her body was found, bound, sexually assaulted, and strangled in the Ka'ehi Lagoon. It was assumed that she may have actually been abducted from that bus stop. This case had alerted the police to the fact that this may be the same killer responsible for Vicki Purdy's death, seeing as they're very similar in nature. They were found the same, and this is such a gruesome way to find these women, you know? So we actually had watched something on this case and because there's really not a ton of information about the Honolulu Strangler out there. I, you know, Mary Jane did the research for this and sent us resources, which we will share as always. And then I kind of went through to try and read some stuff. And there's just not really a lot of information about the victims themselves or about the Honolulu Strangler case. So um, it was kind of hard to find some stuff. But um, we did watch a thing on this, a breaking homicide, who has Derek Lavasser, who has been on our show before for an episode, and Chris Mohandi. And they were saying in that it's not common knowledge, but like if you know anything about 
forensics and everything, then whoever was killing these women and putting their bodies in water, they would know that that would destroy evidence in and of itself. And so they kind of thought they were dealing with someone that may have at least a little bit of knowledge of that yeah. kind of thing of how to get away with it and how, you know, how to throw the police off of, of giving them any clues to, you know, locate this person. Right. So I thought that was interesting. I don't think the average person would think, you know, think about it that way, but they seem to think that that was why they kept finding bodies in water. Right. Two weeks after Regina disappeared on January 30th, there was a third woman that became the target of what was now believed to be a serial killer. Denise Hughes was a hardworking 21-year-old telecommunications secretary, and she failed to show up for work on the morning of January 30th. She often commuted to work by bus. Her mom always worried about her standing out and waiting for the bus all alone, so she would tell her to wait until she knew the bus was coming and then just run out to the bus. Denise usually really did this, but for some reason on that day, she decided to wait at the bus stop just a little bit earlier. She was found strangled and sexually assaulted with her hands bound behind her back by three young fishermen on February 1st on the Moana Lua stream, just one mile up from where the other victims were found in the Kaehi Lagoon. Police suspected that they had a serial killer on their hands, but they had never dealt with this kind of case before. So on February 5th, 1986, they enlisted the help of the FBI. They also contacted the Green River Task Force to help as well, since law enforcement in Seattle were unfortunately veterans in dealing with serial killers by this time in 1986. So this is when the Green River Killer was going on and all these, um, I believe, sex workers were his target and they were just finding them everywhere. They were thinking that, at least on the the breaking homicide thing, they were kind of saying that they felt like there could be similarities and they were looking at timelines and stuff and wondering if they had, you know, similar MOs. They're just, Hawaii's never dealt with this before. I mean, in Florida, this is called a Monday, but Hawaii doesn't know what to do. So they, they're in contact with, you know, people who do know what's going on. Like I was saying, the concept of a serial killer was actually so foreign to the people in Hawaii, the journalists covering the case had to keep explaining to the public exactly what the term serial killer meant. The FBI profile of the killer determined that he was an opportunist who attacked women who were believed to be very vulnerable, um, such as women that are standing at bus stops or maybe broken down on the highway. And he's not someone that stalks his victims. It's definitely like, oh, this lady's, you know, by herself. And he just takes that chance to do that as opposed to one of those night stalker. Oh, those people creep me out too, but it's a different thing. Yeah. He also lives or works in the areas of these attacks, such as Waipahu, Eva Beach, or the areas around Sand Island. After the body of Denise Hughes was found, the Honolulu Police Department, as Melissa said, rounded up a serial killer task force, but they really had their work cut out for them. As I said in the beginning, in the mid to late 80s, there were thousands of migrant workers in Oahu due to a telecommunications boom that had attracted them to the area. Hawaii was also filled with military personnel with Army, Navy, and Marine Corps installations all over the islands, not to mention the 10.5 million people who visited the state as tourists. It wasn't long before the Stranglers struck again. The fourth victim, 25-year-old Luis Medeiros, was last seen on March 26, 1986, after a flight she had taken into Honolulu. She had been on the island of Kauai for the reading of her mother's will. Luis had been estranged from her family for some time, so she hoped that her visit home would start the healing process between she and her family. Since she had two young kids at home in Waipahu that she left in the care of her boyfriend's family, she made the trip as brief as possible, eager to get home to her children. She decided to take the late night flight back to Oahu and told her boyfriend's family that she would take the bus back home. She arrived back on Oahu, but disappeared as she was waiting for the bus. Her decomposing body was found April 2nd by the Waikele stream by construction workers on April 2nd, 1986. She was found with her hands bound behind her back, strangled and sexually assaulted, just like the other three women before her. Police set up a sting operation with female officers at both the Keahi Lagoon and the Honolulu Airport, but they were unsuccessful. All of these stories are super sad. This one really broke my heart um, with her just coming back from this, her mother's death and to be coming right. home and is so gruesomely killed. Yeah, it's absolutely terrible. 
And we're going to get into more of this story after a quick word from this week's sponsors. Life comes at you fast, but when you're looking for counseling, minutes can feel like hours and hours can feel like days. You want help quickly, but how will you fit it into your schedule? Our problems rarely arise during normal work hours, so why is counseling mainly available during normal business hours? BetterHelp Online Counseling is there for you. Is there something that interferes with your happiness or maybe something that's preventing you from achieving your goals? BetterHelp has you covered and at times that are convenient for you. BetterHelp offers licensed professional counselors who are specialized in issues such as depression, anxiety, relationships, trauma, grief, and more. You can connect with your professional counselor in a safe and private online environment. You can schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist without ever having to leave the house. BetterHelp is secure, convenient, and professional. If you ever find you want to change counselors, you can do so at any time with no additional charge. Financial aid is also available to those who qualify. Best of all, it is truly an affordable option, and Moms and Murder listeners get 10% off your first month. Simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you'll love within 24 hours. Go to betterhelp.com slash moms and use discount code moms for 10% off your first month. Again, for 10% off your first month, go to betterhelp.com slash moms and use discount code moms. The other day I was making a list of things to do when I came across last week's list of things to do, which literally just made my list double in size. Life is moving fast, even when it feels like we can't cross a single thing off of it. While our modern life isn't simple, a modern home can be. All Modern is an online-only destination for everything modern. And the best part is, it's priced for real life. I've been searching for a perfect new TV stand that not only looked great, but also met all of our needs. Like not having windows so that everyone can see the way I shove things inside of cabinets, or all the tiny fingerprints left behind by Cheeto hands. After selecting a few specific search filters and browsing through the options that fit my criteria, I was able to find a beautiful stand with sliding doors, perfect for hiding all of my organizational shortcomings. As with all furniture purchases from All Modern, the shipping was fast and free, and my new TV stand was delivered just days after I placed my order. We've all found a beautiful piece of furniture on Instagram, stopped scrolling long enough to check out the store it's from, closed our eyes, and held our breath waiting for the price. You can find that same sofa or coffee table that you loved on Instagram, but for way less, and you can get it fast. All Modern offers modern styles from mid-century and Scandinavian to minimalist. It's so simple to shop. You can browse at home or while you're sitting in the car pickup line at school, and you can find it easy and get it quick. All Modern, the style you love, the prices you want, when you want it. It's that simple. For 10% off your first purchase at allmodern.com, use the promo code MOMS. That's promo code MOMS. You're already on your phone, so check it out. You could find your next sofa before the end of this podcast. And now back to the episode. So at this point in Honolulu, they found four separate victims, and they're realizing they have somewhat of a serial killer on their hands. Not somewhat. They're realizing there's a serial killer on their hands. And at this point, that's when the last known victim of the Honolulu Strangler was found. The victim was named Linda Pesci, and she was a 36-year-old, making her actually the oldest victim to fall prey to this killer. She left for work on April 29th and told her roommate she would be late that evening because of a late work meeting. When their roommate discovered that she had not returned from work the next morning, she called her work, only discovered that she had not even made it to work the previous day. She immediately called the police. So police were contacted by a mechanic named Howard Gay, and he told them that a psychic told him that Linda Pesci's body would be on Sand Island. He went there and discovered the bones and brought the police, and those bones were determined by police to be actually pig bones. Sand Island is a small island used for industrial work in a Coast Guard port. It's located just across the Ka'ehi Lagoon to the east of the airport. As they searched these surrounding areas, Gay deliberately avoided and prevented police from searching a particular area just 75 yards away from the spot where they found the psychic revealed pig bones. Hmm. So, yeah, like... How do you even keep the police from searching an area? I was kind of interested yeah. by that. Like, how do you say like, oh, nope. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. guys. This is my property. Like, you don't own any rights to this. It doesn't make any sense to me. 
And you would but think I, that the police would be like, yeah, actually, that's exactly where we're going to search now. Yeah. Except they could know at this point, uh, this is kind of fishy. We'll let him do his thing. He can't stay here all night. We'll just wait until he leaves. Yeah, that's true. And then we'll go over there. At this point, the mechanic leaves and the police keep searching and eventually find Pesci's body in the area of Sand Island that the mechanic was deliberately trying to avoid. After Pesci's body was discovered, the police set up roadblocks to question commuters on what they had seen that day. Witnesses reported that they had seen a light-colored van and a Caucasian man with Pesci's car on Nimitz Highway, which is a road that runs by Sand Island. Police later arrested Howard Gay, the mechanic that had led them to the Sand Island, by way of a psychic. And P.S., there was never a psychic. He was in contact with no one. He just told the police that a psychic told him. You know, there would be, Linda would be there. Right. So Howard drove a cream-colored van and worked for one of the air freight companies at the Honolulu airport. Howard said nothing and looked down with his arms folded for hours during his interview. So none of the women um, these victims had that were found had any major defensive wounds, which meant to the police that they had to have felt comfortable enough with the suspect to get into his vehicle willingly. It was also determined by medical examiners that the women had little to no semen in um, any of the samples collected from their bodies. This led to the conclusion that the suspect had had a vasectomy. So they actually had like a few explanations that they were trying to kind of go through uh, to explain why these obvious sexual assaults would not have there wouldn't have been very much DNA by way of semen left behind from the perpetrator. So they had said, like, maybe he had some kind of medical condition that just prevented him from producing a lot. Or, you know, they said maybe obviously having a vasectomy would cause that as well. That would be an explanation for it. So that seemed to be the one that they went with. They said he probably had a vasectomy and that was why none of these victims had very much of his DNA found in them. So... Howard's ex-wife actually provided some interesting information when the police finally contacted her and spoke with her. And she said that Howard was a smooth talker and also revealed that he had this bondage fetish and that he always wanted to tie her up with her hands behind her back. So Howard's wife actually did not live with him in Hawaii. She lived on the mainland in California and would just go fly there and visit Howard while he was working. But she told the TV show Breaking Homicide that she and their kids had come to Hawaii to surprise Howard and he got very angry at her for showing up kind of unannounced and made them stay in a hotel before ultimately forcing them to return home. So red flags, red flags, red flags. Can you imagine? No. Going to visit your husband away on work and he's like mad that you showed up there and makes you sleep in a hotel of all things. Yeah, no, that would, that's, (laughs) that's a deal breaker, ladies. Yeah. Yeah. So he did have a girlfriend on the island, of course, and the girlfriend actually corroborated a lot of what his wife was saying about the bondage stuff and further explained to the police that on nights that he would have get into fights with her, he would also leave the house angry and he wouldn't come back for hours. So they determined through talking to this woman, the girlfriend, that the nights that these big fights occurred, that he would not come back they lined up with every single one of these women that they had found murdered. So Howard lived in Ava Beach, which is located directly west of Honolulu Airport, and it's about 17 miles away by highways, and just five miles from where Louise Medeiros' body was found. The route that he would drive to work passed by each location that um, all of the victims were found. So on Breaking Homicide, they actually called this ex-wife, And they talked to her. And one of the interesting things that they found out, like Derek Lavasser asked her point blank, I guess she didn't want to be on camera or anything like that. So this was all via phone call. And then he kind of told the audience about it, that he had had a vasectomy years before. And so that was kind of something that came up that, you know, kind of further narrows their search. But I don't know if you remember this. Um, It's not in the research here, but this was kind of an interesting point. I thought they spoke to a waitress who had never been spoken to prior and she worked in the same general area and she had, you know, regular customers that would come and this one guy would come and, you know, ordered all the time and she was very comfortable with him, but he kind of skeeved her out. But like 
he was nice enough. And so he found out that she was, was she walking home or riding the bus? Something like that. And he he offered to give her a ride. And she was just like, mm, no, it, something didn't feel right about it. So she she's like telling him, no, I, no I, you know, I'm not sure, blah, blah, blah. And there's this group of bikers who are also there a lot, I guess. And they say to her, you know, you know, is this guy bothering you? And she's like, yeah. And she's like, one of them offers to give me a ride and I let him. So like, you know, she like obviously had a different vibe from this guy. And she said whenever she went to leave with the biker, the gentleman that was like her regular customer stood up, like slammed his hand, fist on the table and left and never came back. To yeah, he was the mad that she left with Furious. that other guy and got a ride and didn't go get a ride with him. And she said a few days later, she heard of one of these victims, one of these stories, like, and realized, oh my goodness. But she said the police never talked to her. She never talked to the police. I guess she didn't really put it together that, that, you know, this all could have happened. She didn't want her last name used because in case this person is still found out. But the interesting thing was, I thought, sorry, I'm kind of like going on this whole breaking homicide thing, but it is an interesting story to watch. But they show her two pictures and it's him at different times, this Howard Gay at different ages, right? And he doesn't really look the same. He looks a little bit the same, but not enough to be like, that's the same guy. Right. Well, in one of the pictures, he had like a mustache right. and he was wearing sunglasses. And then in the other one, he like didn't have a mustache and or any facial hair. Yeah. And he was bald and, and wasn't wearing I think he was just wearing like regular glasses or yeah. something like that. So it could have looked like if you saw these two pictures not side by side, like you wouldn't assume that they were the same person. Honestly, if you didn't know him, you would not think it was the same person just because it was like a different time. It was just enough off to not be like, oh, that's this guy with a mustache, it looked, he looked a little bit different, but I guess when they showed him to her, she said, they said, you know, does this guy fit the description? She's like, honestly, they both do, you know, both of these people do. And they're like, well, actually that's the same guy, which was really interesting. Cause a lot of times you'd hear somebody say, oh, well the guy on the right really kind of does, but she, you know, just to have that in her memory and not to know that it was the same person. I thought that was pretty interesting. And, yeah. um, yeah, that, I just can't imagine being her and hearing this whole story as it went down. And he had a he had a light colored van. Like there was a lot of things in there that just was like, oh my goodness, you know, she really, really could have dodged this whole thing and, you know, listened to her gut luckily and and did not go with this guy. But how scary for her, even after the fact, realizing like how close of an encounter you had with somebody who is this dangerous and like this capable of Mm -hmm. of causing like literally bodily harm to the point of death. Like I would be, I just don't think I would ever leave my house again if I had found out that I had been in that close of contact with somebody. Yeah, it would be totally terrifying. And and I mean, I think she's still very terrified about it. And it just, I I felt bad because I feel like the police really tried their best in this case and they just didn't have a lot to go on really. And DNA was not what it is today at all. Um, So it, it was a totally, it was a different time. I felt bad for her that either she didn't, she was so scared to really talk about it or she just didn't know, realize that it would be per- would be really pertinent information at the time. So it was interesting to hear her on there because sometimes, you know, when they bring in people from the past, you're like, okay, well, I don't really know if you saw this person. But with her, it was like, oh, wow. Like there was just a lot there that it didn't feel very forced. I don't know. It just felt like she was just like, yeah, this, you know, this is the story. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Sorry, I went off on a tangent, but no, no, it was kind of an interesting part of the story. And we will be right back um, with the conclusion of this story after one last break from a word from this week's sponsors. I had big plans on Saturday. I was going to do it all. My family and I were going to the park. I had plans to work on some editing for the show, run a few errands, and make a nice dinner with the family. Unfortunately, our plans changed. The kids had a play date I had hoped would cancel, and we ended up dealing with a pop-in. By the time I realized how late it was, I was just happy I could still make the meal I was planning for our family, except I never made it to the grocery store. Before I cried in my pie, I remembered I didn't even have any pie to cry in and jumped on my Instacart app and started ordering things to make dinner, plus pie, and my groceries were delivered to my door at a time that worked for me. Instacart is here to rescue you from your week. 
With Instacart, you can shop from your favorite stores with your groceries being delivered from local and national retailers in as little as one hour or at a time that works with your schedule. And if you're a planner, you can even order your groceries a few days ahead of time. Plus, you can avoid the lines in parking and the blasted traffic. Here's how Instacart works. You can either get the app or go to instacart.com and shop for the groceries you need. Your Instacart shopper gathers your groceries with care and picks out excellent produce for you and will contact you whenever necessary. Your items are bagged so your hot items stay hot and your cold items stay cold. Try Instacart and get $10 off your first order. To get this limited time offer, go to instacart.com or download the mobile app and enter our promo code MOMS10 at checkout. That's $10 off your first order today at instacart.com or through the mobile app. And don't forget to enter our promo code MOMS10. Do you have a laundry chair or a laundry couch? Or are you one of those fancy people with a laundry basket? It doesn't matter what you use. We are all battling this laundry monster together, and we can help defeat him with Drops. Drops invented the laundry pod, and then they made it even better. Drops is amazing because by selling directly to you, they avoid the middleman and are able to offer their products for a fraction of the price offered by their competitors. Use less, save more. That's the convenience of Drops. And Drops products are packaged in the most sustainable way. Their plastic-free, compostable box even doubles as the shipping container. You can subscribe and save an extra 20% with automatic Drops wash plans. There are no membership fees and no gotchas. You can skip, delay, or modify your order at any time. The best part is there is free shipping on all orders. Drops are cruelty-free and never tested on animals because Drops believes in kindness, not taking harmful shortcuts. Drops is also manufactured in the U.S., Drops is proud to offer their effective green cleaning products manufactured right here in our own backyard. Drops believes in supporting local jobs, communities, small businesses, and fair wages. We've talked a lot about how great the Drops detergent pods are, but I also really love the dishwasher pods. I am a chronic overpourer, so I love having a pod I can throw in the dishwasher and know I didn't overpour or underpour, and I can have just the right amount. And it keeps my dishes looking sparkly clean, just like new. Easy and effective. Visit drops.com slash murder30. That's D-R-O-P-P-S dot com slash murder30 and enter murder30 to get an extra 30% off your first order of convenient, plastic-free, eco-friendly cleaning. Every drop counts. And now back to the episode. So now the police kind of have their eye on this man, Howard Gay. They realize that there is definitely a connection to all of these, sadly, all of these women who have been murdered. They are all seem to have the same, you know, MO. And they are kind of having their eye on this specific guy now. And he kind of inserted himself into the investigation, which is something that we hear about sometimes in cases like this, where the actual guilty party will try to somehow work with the police and offer up their help, which police are on to that, though. We've heard about that before, too, where the police are like, if you are too helpful in an investigation, you go from looking like a helpful person to looking like a guilty person in some respects. So that's kind of what happened here when he was like, oh, the psychic told me that you would find this woman's remains. And then they actually went there and found these remains like the police aren't stupid enough to believe that a psychic actually told you that they are looking at you now and saying, obviously you knew that for a reason. Like right. you have this information and you just thought that you were smart enough to, to somehow fool us. Like you want people otherwise. to see your work and to find them. That was one thing they talked about too. in the breaking homicide where in one of the cases, the body was actually um, tied up to the bridge. Do you remember that? And yeah. like, yes. so it, so the, um, the victim did not float away. All of these victims were found pretty easily. Like they were found in water, but they were found close enough where it wasn't, you know, in a mine shaft or something. I don't know what the right. Hawaiian version of that is, but um, but where it was like they wanted to be found. They don't want to be caught, but they want people to freak out and and to see, you know, that take over in people's minds. So Howard Gay was interrogated and he actually failed a polygraph test that was given to him, but he was eventually released. And the case against him was really just circumstantial, but it was a very, very strong case. However, prosecutors refused to take it on because they believe that they only had one shot to prosecute and they just didn't really feel like they could 
get it done with the evidence that they had. They didn't think they had enough to get a conviction. So now we're going to talk about some of the evidence that they did have against him that kind of tied him to all of these terrible strangling murders. So he worked at an airport freight company called Flying Tigers Air Cargo, which is now out of business. And they, the business was located along Lagoon Drive, which is a road that runs just adjacent to the Kaehi Lagoon. So he actually worked from 8 p.m. to 3 a.m., which means that he was out of his house, you know, at that in those middle of the night kind of times he was out kind of ro- roaming about. He did drive a light colored van. He did not have an alibi for the times of the attacks. And the girlfriend, you know, did verify that he was gone on those nights, but could not account for his whereabouts. So he also, like I just said a little bit ago, led the police to one of the bodies and kind of put himself in the middle of this investigation. He failed a polygraph test. He refused to speak to the police during police interviews. And then we, he actually left the islands and the murders just suddenly stopped. So even though this is all very circumstantial, it is kind of a strong circumstantial case. I think I don't think there's a lot of people that look at this case and don't think that he was the Honolulu Strangler. He was never officially charged and he is still considered innocent until proven guilty in a court of law, although now it doesn't really matter because he passed away years ago, I think early in in the early 2000s. Again, the police were not able to obtain DNA samples or anything that would have been able to connect him to the case. It's just kind of one of those cases that, you know, will probably never have a real conclusion, although I think the general consensus is that he was the Honolulu Strangler. So we've been talking about the um, show on ID, Breaking Homicide, and Chris Mahandi learned previously undisclosed information from the retired Honolulu Police Department. This one homicide director was named Louis Souza. And one thing that he learned during their investigation was that there was a parachute cord that was actually used to bind all the victim's hands behind their backs. And he used the same method in all of these women. So all five of them had were found in similar spots and also were found in the same with the parachute cord, hands behind their back, same MO. So Sousa was really reluctant to reveal the name of the suspect at first since, you know, Howard Gay had never been charged. During the show, Sousa and a former prosecutor and former Honolulu mayor, Peter Carlisle, both stated that they believe if DNA technology was available back then, Howard Gay would have definitely been convicted of the murders. Again, innocent until proven guilty. So this is just them talking. Unfortunately, as Mandy said, Howard Gay passed away sometime in the early 2000s on the mainland. So one thing they learned on, or, you know, we just talked about is that the murders suddenly really stopped. And during this investigation on breaking homicide, they learned that after Howard had been released, he left Hawaii and went back to California. Apparently, his son had a high school graduation. And a few days after this graduation, Howard Gay's son was killed in a traffic accident. He was actually hit by a car while he was changing a tire. Apparently, this affected him so much that he became a born-again Christian. One thing they talked about whenever murders of serial killers end, a lot of times there can be a huge event in someone's life um, that can cause them to change or cause them to stop or cause them to, you know, pause. Like if you look at BTK, that was one where it went years and years without anything happening. And then, you know, things would start to happen again. So they don't really know, but that's what they were kind of looking at as being like maybe something that really influences life, his son's death, and then becoming a Christian. The murders committed by the, by the Honolulu Strangler rock the island paradise. Police were quoted in the newspaper saying, this involves everybody's wives, everybody's girlfriends, and everybody's daughters. We have lost our innocence as a community. Oh, Mary Jane, Mandy talked about at the beginning, her personal connection to the case. She actually joined an outrigger canoe racing team, and they practice in the Ka'ehi Lagoon, where three of the victims were found. And she said she thinks about them every time they go out on these boats. And Wow. Yeah, it's so sad. And strangulation death is not something we've really discussed much on our show, but it's really not all that uncommon. Strangulation and suffocations were the third leading cause of homicides in 2016, accounting for 502 of the 19,362 murders committed that year. So that was the story of the Honolulu Strangler, a very interesting story and case, and definitely 
when I think of Hawaii, I don't think of any like terrible, terrible things. So I think of Dog the Bounty Hunter. That's what I always it bothered think of. me. Yeah. So I can't imagine how the people of Hawaii feel probably about that still today. Yeah. Thank you, Mary Jane, for helping us research this week's case. Yeah. And um, so, Melissa, before we get out of here, yes. we're going to do some last thing before we go. So we have been talking a little bit on each. So we've just been kind of letting everybody know that this is what we do. The episode is over. If you don't want to listen to us talk about not murder, then you can skip right on past this. But if you enjoy hearing us talk about absolute nonsense, then you can stay. So we're doing our segment last thing before we go. Melissa. Yes. This week on social media, I have seen probably five or six different people have asked. They want to hear the story of how we met again. I know we've talked about it on the show before and people who have already heard the story seem to think this is just an amazing story. So (laughs) do, do we want to tell the story again of how we met? Yes. Do you want to say it from your point of view or do you want to go from mine? You go from yours. Oh, How do we meet? why? Because people think you're judgmental when you tell it from your point of view. <laughs> I mean, you said it, not me. I mean, apparently a few people have said it actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so Melissa and I, we had our, our two little guys. Um, they were babies. I think your son was four months old. Mine was probably like six or seven months old. We were just desperate to go out and meet friends because that's what you do when you're a stay at home mom. And we joined a meetup group. I had already gone to a few meetups with this specific group and met a few of the moms and they were all really lovely. And then we went to a pumpkin patch in October of that year. And um, Melissa was there. And I think it was your first time. Was it your first time? It was. It was. It was a yeah. So <laughs> she got lucky, and I was also there. I thought she was cool because she was wearing her son in a baby carrier, which I was all about baby wearing at that time in my life. Didn't take much to excite me. I saw a mom wearing a baby, and I was like, oh, I should be friends with her. So, <laughs> so I don't even know how we started talking. Honestly, um, I don't even remember that part. I only remember the part of the story where Melissa likes to say that I remember you on a different day. I don't even remember you that day. You remember me. You don't remember me at the pumpkin patch. I remember your son though. I remember your son because he was so cute and he would raise his hand and talk like and answer questions. (laughs) So I didn't, I don't know. I probably met you, but that day was like the day my um, nephew was born and he was born in Malaysia and he was in ICU and it was just like, I didn't even know what I was doing there. Like I was just totally panicked. So that day is a blur for me. But the next time I met you, like that I oh. remember meeting you, was at <laughs> someone's house for a play date, same group. It was my second time going. And this little girl walked by Mandy's car and she said something about like, oh my gosh, there's a lot of trash in here. <laughs> <Something>. <laughs> and that's whenever I knew I could be friends with this girl. Like that was who I was yeah. making a beeline to talk to because, you know, that's that's the level I, I keep in my vehicle and I look for friends with the same so yeah, <laughs> that's it. That is a story I get judged for a lot, but it's a hundred percent true. <laughs> it is a hundred percent true. I have a mom car and it's got trash in it on any given day. That little girl, she didn't even realize that she was judging me so hard. But honestly, I know that girl. She judged you hard. She judges everybody hard. <laughs> So that's how we met. I had a trash car and Melissa was like... I also had a trash car. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm not judging you. Same same thing. And I have, ever since that day, never cleaned my car. <laughs> <laughs> I've cleaned mine maybe once. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So that was, I guess, um, yeah, like five years ago, like more than five years mm-hmm. ago now. Yeah. My son, my little one is about to be six in a mm-hmm. couple of weeks. So yeah, it's been a long time. So here we are. Okay, so the next one, Nicole R. in our Facebook group wants to know what is our favorite episode of the show and how do we pick which cases we're going to cover? Can you go first on this? Because I need to think. What's my favorite yeah. episode? Yeah, so um, I have said it, I think, before, but um, long standing. My favorite episode that we've ever done is the Vampire Cult Killers. Yeah. I absolutely love that episode. I love that story. Um, It's just full of so much ridiculous, and I love that story so much. So that's my favorite episode. I don't know what yours is. Um, Mine might be – so I like that one. I love all the ones where we've had people on. Josh Megawitz, that was great. And, um, of course, Ali Sweeney, that was wonderful. But my favorite one of just you and I would be – I like the, um, the Dexter Copycat Killer. Oh, yeah. That was a good one. I also really like the Sun Jim Gang. Mm-hmm. That one is a really good one. Honestly, 
all of them. So if you haven't <laughs> listened to them, <laughs> now's your chance to go back and listen. We love them all, except the Casey Anthony episodes, which everyone that joins our Facebook group tells us they love us, love them, and I kind of think they're lying. I have to be honest. Yeah. They were terrible. <laughs> They were awful. We have come a long way since Casey. I hope. I really Uh, hope. Yeah. (laughs) So how do we pick? Um, So I do. Melissa is lovely and lets me take the reins and I will just tell her this is what we're doing this week. So sometimes uh, Melissa like will just be like, oh, I know about this crazy story. We should do this one. And then I'll be like, "Okay, I'll do that one. Now I get a lot of these suggestions out of our Facebook group or ones that you guys email to us or send in. Unfortunately, we can't do all of the ones that are sent in to us. We do get a lot of suggestions for ones that of course, involve kids or anything like that. You know, we just don't touch those with a 10 foot pole. So if we ignored your suggestion, we still love you. That's, uh, it's not a personal thing against you, but that's pretty much where I get most of them now is from the Facebook group, just because we have a master thread going in there. And there's so many now that I have, you know, I look at every week and try to see what jumps out at me. And at the end of the day, that's really what it is for me. It's, it's what, which thing I read that grabs my attention right away that week. And sometimes I'll look through them and I don't, you know, one of them doesn't really do anything for me. But then when I go back and look at it again a couple of weeks later, then I'm like, oh, this one's interesting. So yeah, if you have put in a suggestion, we will probably get to it eventually. It just depends on my mood that week, really. I hate oh, to well, say like to all of you. <laughs> she is salty. <laughs> All right, so we'll do one more because this one I love and I really am dying to hear your answer to this, Melissa, because I know you have had a rough time lately. Maybe not lately. I like that you're (laughs) – you always like to hear things that like hurt me. (laughs) I feel like – I feel like we do it to each other. Okay, yeah, so sure. our lovely friend D, hi D, she's longtime listener. We love her. Um, She wants to know what time we go to bed and how much sleep do we get at night? I am terrible. I – go to sleep sometime between 12 and 2, which is not normal. I would not suggest. But my kids (laughs) um, are exhausting. They're really exhausting. So at night, I will do anything. I will stay up till whatever time necessary to be able to like literally just watch nonsense on TV and just kill my brain cells. That's all I'm looking to do at night. So sometimes it's 12 and sometimes it's 2. I try to get it before then. I probably get up at seven, so I get up probably a little bit later um, so I can sleep from 12 to seven, which is not true, or two to seven. Two to seven is probably more accurate. My son still wakes up like last night he woke up, so I go lay in his twin bed with him at all hours of the night. Um, So I don't call my sleep good. I don't even know if I'm conscious right now, but um, it's gotten better. (laughs) It's better. Like I can go in there and lay with him, but he's five and I'm just like six foot tall and we're sharing a twin bed at night. It is just not a good night's sleep, (laughs) (laughs) but he's adorable and I love him and he won't let me do it forever. Well, you always look lovely and never tired and you're always just so great. I would never know that you didn't sleep at night. (laughs) Oh my goodness. That was very strange. (laughs) I look exactly as tired as I am. So thank you. So I actually stay up. I'm kind of a night owl also, actually. Um, I don't stay up until two usually, but I probably go to bed sometime between like 1130 and one. And it depends. Like, it just honestly depends. And sometimes I do get really tired and I kind of fall asleep on the earlier side of that, like on the couch or whatever. My kids now have gotten to where uh, my older son is nine. And like I said, my little guy is going to be six. And my older son seems to think that he has a right to stay awake until like 10 o'clock at night now. And I don't even know how we got to this point in life because I used to be that parent who would be like, okay, it's eight o'clock, go brush your teeth. We're going to read a book. We're going to start getting ready. And like, I would be having them go to bed by 830. And now if I even suggest getting ready for bed at 830, they look at me like I'm insane. And they're like, what? We don't go to bed at this time. So I'm like, wait, (laughs) when did you stop going to bed at this time? (laughs) Like, this was not my choice. By the time I get them in bed, I usually try to have them in bed before 10, God willing, but sometimes I don't. So they kind of stay up a little bit later. But um, also before anyone judges, we homeschool so our kids can sleep until two in the afternoon. It doesn't matter. Exactly. Don't worry about the time. And it doesn't bother me. Right. It doesn't bother me because I do like to stay up late. So then sometimes they will reward me by letting me sleep until about eight o'clock the next morning. So that's kind of, I think, pretty accurate. Probably I stay up until like at least like one o'clock in the morning and then I'll get up around eight and then 
the kids are usually up before me, but they're pretty good about being pretty quiet and playing on their tablets or something until I get up and out of bed. And Oh, you know. well, teach mine that one because it's literally <laughs> as soon as somebody's up there yelling for me. I'm like, what do you need? I just want to know where you are. I'm literally always in my room or, right. <laughs> or your room. <laughs> I have never left the house before you woke up before. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, yes, that's our sleep patterns. If you're trying to plan to kill us, I guess the thing to learn there is between two and seven is probably your best shot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't kill us, please. We are so excited to tell you about a new show from Parcast Network called Crimes of Passion. Crimes of Passion is hosted by our dear friend Lainey from True Crime Fan Club. Every week, Crimes of Passion looks into what happens when true love meets true crime. It's like a real-life Dateline episode. Crimes of Passion analyzes the relationship dynamics and also the psychology that leads to the crimes, betrayal, and sometimes even murder. New episodes of Crimes of Passion come out every Wednesday, and you can listen to the first episode on Wilma Hoyt right now. I listened to this first one and whoa, it made me all wide-eyed listening to it. Coming up are episodes on Amy Fisher and Joey Buttafuoco, Lorena Bobbitt, and Jody Arias. Search for and subscribe to Crimes of Passion wherever you listen to podcasts. Again, search Crimes of Passion or visit parcast.com slash passion to listen now. Have a great week, everyone. Check out Lainey's new podcast. Check out our Crime Con. Come to Crime Con. Come see us. Yeah, and just come. Yeah, just Don't check it out. Yeah, just buy a ticket. Just come. <laughs> I mean, research is always best, but then you'll want to come. So we will talk to you guys next week. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to the Moms and Murder podcast. Make sure to check back with us next week for a new episode. You can also find us at momsandmurder.com where you can connect with us via social media. Please make sure you subscribe and give us five stars because giving us four stars would be a crime. Thanks so much.